Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As Jesus went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and the hired men, and followed Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So when I was in seminary, they told us simple rules of interpretation. Whenever you were going to preach, whatever passage you were going to preach on, you needed to stay in that particular text. Historically, preachers have always wanted to jump out of that text, and so my professors were saying you should never preach outside of what it is. You let the text speak for itself. And today, I'm absolutely going to break all of those rules. <laughs> See, the problem with interpretation, and when you set up rules of interpretation, you can always guide the way the final result comes out. Have you ever been part of a listening session, either in a municipality or a school district, and they say, we want to get people together to find out what they want. But the truth is, they already have a plan, and they're going to get you there. Amen. Right? So if our professors say this is the way you have to do it, very clearly they're going to get similar interpretations of the passage. Now, why would I do this? Well, the truth is the Gospel of Mark is sort of like what I grew up with, what was called Cliff Notes. Today they call them Spark Notes, or other mm -hmm. folks might even use Wikipedia in that way. The teachers would say, don't use these, they're not reliable, and we all did anyway. Mark's gospel is reliable in that sense. It does tell the story, but it's sort of the watered-down version. In other words, there's no flourishing. We don't know really much about John if we stick with the gospel of Mark. We kind of have to go to the gospel of Luke to get a little bit more of his backstory, and so I'm going to do that on this day. And I'm pretty sure the folks who heard these stories originally would have known on some level the backstory of who John was and his relationship to Jesus and the stories of Elizabeth and Mary and Zechariah. And so we're going to fill in some of those gaps. The truth of the story is this passage in its heart is not about fishing for people in the way that we've been told in the church. This is about saving souls so that when we die, we'll go to paradise. It was not about keeping people out of hell after death. It was not about that at all. It was about this strange beginning where Jesus' ministry begins when his cousin goes to jail. Now that might seem strange. Some of you actually have family members who have been in the prison system or friends. I have and I do both. Some of you don't. But that passage right there reminds us that this whole ministry begins when somebody decided that whatever John was up to was so dangerous that he had to be locked up behind bars. So all of Jesus' ministry really is lived under the threat of prison. That's where we're going today. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so who is John the Baptist? Well, we have to do a little backstory. You might remember in weeks past, I've talked about this. John was the son of Zechariah. Zechariah was one of the chief priests in the temple, which means that John the Baptist was a child of privilege. He lived in the city, and he lived in the faith community. He was a child of the faith. And his father probably came home to talk about what it was like being a religious leader, so he got to hear all of the dirt in his household. And lo and behold, John does not turn his back on his faith, but he turns his back on his lot in life, which would have been to follow in his father's footsteps and become a priest in the temple. He gives up his privilege. He gives up what had been given to him, but instead picks up what I've come to believe is authentic faith for him. 
doing away with religious practice or religiosity or religious language. What he was saying is we have to live more faithfully. So let's go out to the Jordan, be baptized, and go back into the world and live authentically in the midst of systems that are broken. And by the way, the faith community is broken then as it is now. It was sort of like living in the world with eyes wide open. The systems are broken. We don't have any illusion of that. We don't live with rose-colored glasses, but we recognize that there is something of value in our faith community. Otherwise, why bother? The stories that have been passed along to us, the stories that have broken down injustice in the world, the ways in which liberation has been found, this idea that we could live as authentic people in a broken world, is a powerful story that the church hasn't really played up to much. In other words, John gives up playing at church and finds an authentic faith, an authentic faith that transforms his life to live differently right now. And then Jesus is baptized. We kind of have to work our way through the story to get here. Jesus is baptized. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. And Jesus is the only one who hears the voice that you are my beloved. Jesus is the only one who sees the skies ripped open. It's a reminder that our own call often is our own. And in order to figure out his call, Jesus has to go out into the wilderness. We did not talk about this, so I'm going to spend just a few moments on this wilderness journey. The spirit that comes and dive bombs into Jesus' head that he sees is the same spirit that throws him, literally the Greek says, throws Jesus out into the wilderness places. And the truth of the matter is, friends, when we go through the wilderness places of our lives, the difficult times, when things fall apart, do not work out like we thought they should, those are the times when there is lesson to be learned. But we often are the only ones who can come up with what that lesson is all about. So how is Jesus tempted? He's tempted first to use his power improperly. What would it be? We talk about Jesus being fully human and fully God, and frankly, some of us are way more comfortable with Jesus being fully God, but the human part means that Jesus probably was tempted to use his power in ways that, well, think about the ways in which human beings use power. The first temptation is, Satan says, turn this stone to bread, feed yourself. It's the temptation to use your power for selfish ends and needs. And then the devil says, worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Well, we all go, well, he doesn't run the world. That's not how that works. So what's going on there? Well, what's going on there is this idea that somehow Jesus could use his power, expediently just take over the whole world. How often are we as human beings tempted to take power? But we're going to use it for good. We're going to play the same rules of those who are doing things that frankly could be considered evil ways of doing things in the world. We're, we're going to do the same thing they do, use the same practices, but we'll use them for good. It's a reminder that even Jesus wasn't going to fall for that because he wouldn't have been able to keep from being tempted either. And then the last one is a little weird. Jesus goes to the top of the temple. Satan says, throw yourself off and the angels will catch you. Right there in the middle of everything. And it's Jesus' rejection of spectacle. Jesus said, I came to worship God alone, not to test God, but on some level, I believe it is this idea that our faith is not about having the fanciest this, that, or the other, so people come in droves. It's about the fact that our faith is about sharing our transformed lives in small, unexpected ways. Jesus went out to the desert. John went out to the desert. Jesus spent most of his many ministry not in the centers of power, reminding us that it's the most unexpected way. It's now it takes us back to Jesus and the passage that I was supposed to be preaching on first. Jesus gets back from the wilderness, and the first thing that happens, John goes to prison. Now, what's Jesus' reaction? How does he respond? Well, if we're not careful, and we don't know a little bit about geography, we think, oh, okay, Jesus goes, John goes to jail, Jesus goes off onto his ministry. But what you have to know is that the Jordan River and the Jerusalem are in the southern part, basically, of Israel, and the Galilee region is way north. Even by car today, it is a three-and-a-half-hour drive, and it's the hill country. 
Galilee was the region of bandits and banditry and folks who refused to participate in the ways of the Roman Empire and refused to participate in the temple state that existed. So as soon as John goes into prison, what Jesus does is run for the hills. Did you catch that? He runs for the hills and continues to proclaim this message of a new way kind of changes things. It sort of takes it out of this innocuous Jesus wants you to fish for people. And says at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry lives under the threat of prison. And we know people who live under the threat of prison all the time. And lo and behold, Jesus later on was saying, you should go visit people in prison like you were in prison yourself. But Jesus runs for the hill country. And then he comes along and he invites people to follow. And they have to know those first disciples had to know that John, who was a popular figure, had been thrown in jail. So when he says, come and follow me, it's not like, oh, this is a good idea. It wasn't just that glib, drop the thing and run. These folks had had to know who Jesus was and know that there was a threat that went behind it. But they believed, probably not fully, as any of us ever really could, that following Jesus came with a possible cause. That his whole ministry was in the shadow of prison, and what we find out is in the shadow of the cross. So when Jesus says, you're going to fish for people, he's not talking about saving souls. That language actually never comes out of Jesus' mouth. It's about finding people and teaching them and us how to live authentically with our faith. How we take what we believe and marry it with how we actually act in the world. We stop hiding behind intentions. It wasn't my intention to do that. I think my grandmother used to say the road to hell are paved with good intentions. I bet maybe some of you have heard that. But we often hide behind the intention. It wasn't my intention to offend. And then all sorts of racist stuff comes following after. The truth is, we're called to live our faith. We may say we believe things, we may feel that we believe things, but until we are able on some small way to put our hands and feet in the service of our faith, we haven't fully bought in yet. And you know what? Some days we do it well, and other days we don't do it at all. That's why it's a daily walk of faith. So where does this impact you? Well, it begins by asking the question, where in your own life has your faith, the idea of following Jesus in your own life, cost you? And maybe there are those who need to hear the question, where are you hungry in your own life? To live more authentically. To finally begin to merge our actions and what we say we believe. And we are good. Presbyterians are good at stating our faith well. And that is important. Because the truth is, without having some idea of what we believe, we'll just run in all sorts of places. But the problem is, is every time we publish some paper, we think, ah, now we've finished. We're done. We don't say that, and we even say, no, we know that this is the end of the work, but I've been on far too many committees that worked on really great papers, the very things, and they just stop being important when we're done. We've got to do better. I heard a story this week of one of the co-founders of a Christian uh, rock band called the Newsboys, which I have to admit I've never listened to. But I know who they are. This was one of the fellows who helped found this band before it became famous, so he never got rich off of what they were doing. But he has now come out and said he's an atheist, that he doesn't believe, and here's why. Basically, it was a lack of authenticity. He said, you know, he'd grown up in a fairly conservative, fundamentalist background of a house and said, you know, I just didn't believe it because I knew what people were doing when they weren't playing at church. When they weren't out in front playing in the band, we knew what they were doing with the groupies. We knew their private doubts and the ways that they didn't live out their faith. And so he finally has just said, I don't believe it at all anymore. Lack of authenticity, lack of integrated, lack of basically saying, look, I fall down all the time. Instead of playing at church, putting on the facade, pretending that everything is all right all the time and that we've got it all together, will not help any 
more? Who wants to be part of having to act like everything's all right all the time in a world that is cracking at the seams? What place does church serve if we say, you're welcome to come here, but you better look this way, act this way, and I don't want to hear about your problems. What if we talked about a faith that says, you know, some days I fall down, other days I feel renewed. I don't act this way anymore because, well, I've decided that as a follower of Jesus, I probably shouldn't do that. Or I've gotten involved with a movement for justice that I never would have found myself otherwise because I'm a follower of Jesus. I had a friend who, during seminary, went to the National March on Washington in the lead up to the Iraq War. This was in the first time we did that. And he was there in the midst of some activists, and they kept asking him, well, why are you here? And he's like, because I'm a follower of Jesus. And they're like, well, the church isn't here. Why would they be here? Because what most folks had heard and seen in their own lives was people who said, we, we're either all pro-war or we're just not going to talk about those things. But if you scratch the surface on Jesus, it's really easy to end up being labeled a troublemaker. So the church as a whole, not just Westminster, these are things we struggle with all the time. But the truth is, if we're interested in following Jesus into transformative ways, acting like we did as church in the 1950s, will no longer work. What that means is that we are not going to save ourselves by creating just the right committee structure system. I know, I know you were hoping for that. We are not going to save ourselves and have a transformative community if we just can create the right sustainable budget. <coughs> we will not be a transformative community if we just find enough new members to fill our old committees and fill our budgets. And we will not be transformed if we continue parking lot and email power plays. It will not happen. And it will not save anyone. And the first step is to be honest with one another and admit it. It's true. But the good news is we're called to create every day, all the time, places where authentic faith can grow. Where failure can be acknowledged. <coughs> Where frustration and places of struggle can be named and prayed over together, even with someone you don't really want to be in the same room with. <coughs> it's about being honest with our lives and saying that transformation is possible. John showed us a way. Jesus invites us to come and follow, and the question is each day for us, will we do it? Or will we be content? with the way things have always been. This is the choice. Today, next week, and for the next hundred years and more on this corner. I've said it before, and I truly believe it, that God has plans for this corner in St. Louis, for this Del Mar divide. We have been moved here for such a time. So the really only question left for us is, do we want to be part of it? Or do we want to watch what God's doing with others? To acknowledge that following is not easy and will cost us. So who's with me? Who wants to live this way? In this place? Together? Amen.